Hi, and welcome to another Access Chat. I'm here with Antonio and Deborah, and we're very pleased to welcome David Lepofsky to talk to us about ODA and the, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act and what's going on in Canada in terms of uh, accessible culture, developments, and all things um, inclusive and, and disability friendly. So welcome, David. Really pleased to have you on. We've had you on a lot of our um, access chats already. You're a very active supporter, so we're really glad to have you on here today. Well, it's great to be on, and it's great to meet uh, you folks, at least uh, going beyond Twitter to actually having human voices exchanging with each other. You guys do fabulous work on Twitter, and I'm honored to be part of this. Oh, thank you. So, um, I, I know you've known Deborah for a while, and, and, and Deborah's um, diary is, is full as usual, so I'm going to let Deborah lead off with her questions first off and, and um, pick up from there. Okay, over to you, Deborah. Yes, David, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, David, thank you for joining us. We're really excited to have uh, such a world-renowned expert on um, Access Chat this week. And uh, Canada's done quite a bit, so we're very curious to learn, you know, what's going on with ODA and, you know, uh, where, you know, all the different things that are happening um, in Canada to make sure that people with disabilities are included. We're also really thrilled to have you on um, as a person that is blind and a person that uses a screen reader. You will be our first. And so we're very excited to welcome you to Access Chat. So tell us more about who you are, David, and about the work you're doing with ODA. Okay, um, I'm a lawyer. I'm totally blind. I've been blind. I had partial vision as a kid, and I've been totally blind since uh, partway through law school. I, I studied law in Toronto uh, from 1976 to 79 at a law school here called Osgoode Hall Law School. And then I did a master's of law at Harvard between 81 and 82. Um, my, my day job isn't connected with disability issues, but my volunteer activity outside my day job uh, uh, is very much involved in this. And I've been involved in volunteer, as a volunteer advocating on accessibility for people with disabilities really since um, the late 1970s or the early 1980s. To bring everybody up to speed about what's going on in Canada, first you have to have it, understand what Canada is all about. We're, I think, the third, one of, one of the largest countries in the world. But we have about, uh, our population is spread out mostly along a ribbon within 100 miles uh, of the U.S. border, spread out over uh, at least five time zones. So it's uh, a limited but significant population, but spread out over a lot of territory. Um, uh, in terms of disability issues uh, and how we've tackled it, um, I really need to take you through two points of, uh, of time, and I'm going to give you 30 years history in about three minutes. So in the 1970s, the mid-1970s, it was perfectly lawful to discriminate against people with disabilities. We had no uh, legal protection either to protect us against discrimination in jobs, government services, private services, uh, any of that kind of stuff. Um, Starting in the late 1970s, a movement started uh, in Canada at a very local level to try to get disability added to our civil rights laws, our anti-discrimination laws. There's an anti-discrimination law in every one of our 10 provinces and for our federal government uh, in Ottawa for its uh, turf. They're called human rights codes. Uh, they had banned discrimination based on grounds like sex and religion and, and race but not disability. Slowly, province by province, amendments were passed to include disability. I got involved in uh, 1979, 1980, in the fight to get disability added to the Ontario Human Rights Code. And with the effort of many of us, we succeeded in 1982. So it was illegal in Ontario since 1982 to discriminate uh, based on uh, a disability and access to jobs, goods, services, housing, and so on. Similarly, legislation was passed federally and another major event for us occurred in 1980 to 82. In 1980, our then Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, uh, decided that Canada should have a constitutional charter of rights, like the U.S. Bill of Rights. And he proposed one, and it was going to include an equality provision, but that equality provision left out disability. In 1980, a number of us, uh, without the benefit of social media or the current technology we use for advocacy, uh, lobbied. And we won an amendment to our Charter of Rights before it was ever passed into law, before it became part of our Constitution, 
to include equality for people with physical mental or mental disabilities in our constitution. So from 1982 forward, we had these very strong anti-discrimination laws. But the problem 10 years later in the early 1990s was that we were not finding that these new rights were translating into practical action on the ground for us. Why is that? Well, it isn't because the rights were being interpreted by courts in an impoverished way, but rather because to enforce those rights, an individual with a disability had to individually sue the organization that had the accessibility barrier, one barrier and one organization at a time. And most people with disabilities just can't take that on. I did it myself. Starting in the mid-90s, I decided I live in Toronto, Canada's biggest city. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as a world-class city, but sadly, for reasons I'm going to give you, we're not. We have a great public transit system, but if you got on a bus or a subway, if you're blind, you have no idea what stop you're at because they refused to call reliably out all the stops. I had to sue the Toronto Transit Commission personally under our Human Rights Code, not once, but twice. Once to force them to announce all subway stops, and after I won, to force them to announce all bus stops. They now do it, but only because I had to bring that fight. It's, it, it was, and it's quite a burden to take on, to take on a major public organization that's got money and lawyers to throw at you. This led, let me end the, the 30 year history with this. Starting in the early 1990s, I and a small group of others collectively decided we needed a new law, not to replace our human rights code and our charter of rights, but to make sure they were effectively implemented to achieve our goal, which is a fully accessible, barrier-free province of Ontario for all people with disabilities, but where we didn't have to sue one barrier at a time to get there. I had the privilege of leading that campaign from 1994 to 2005, and in 2005, coming up on the 10-year anniversary in about eight weeks, the Ontario legislature made history by passing landmark accessibility law it's called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. It requires Ontario to become fully accessible within 20 years of its enactment by 2025. That's less than 10 years away from now. And it requires the Ontario government to lead us there, not to fix all the barriers in society, but to lead us there. And the way the Ontario government is supposed to lead us there is by developing, enacting, and enforcing detailed regulations called accessibility standards to tell organizations in the public and private sectors, what barriers they got to remove and when they got to remove them by. So the government's got to create all the accessibility standards we need to ensure we get to that goal, and it's got to enforce those standards effectively so we're sure that people comply with them. Um, so that's, uh, and Ontario was the first to pass this kind of law. Since then, Manitoba has passed a comparable law, and um, Nova Scotia, one of the other provinces in Canada, has com the government's committed to develop this kind of law and we're waiting to see if other provinces and our federal government will do uh, the same. So that's the background of in terms of the, the, the legal landscape. Um, uh, I now, uh, the last thing I'll just tell you is I now lead the coalition called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. We're the um, nonpartisan coalition that's been campaigning for the past 10 years to try to get this legislation effectively implemented. And if you're a Twitter person, the hashtag we use is hashtag AODA, which stands for Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. My Twitter handle is at David Lepofsky and our coalition is at AODA Alliance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. But uh, in are you doing any type of work with people working in, in the similar space across Canada? How you connect with them and what type of, how, how you work? Yeah. I, I'll tell you this. Uh, informally, uh, in some cases, when a group formed in Manitoba called Barrier Free Manitoba, they uh, very have, have been very active on Twitter, uh, uh, they approached us and we gave them lots of advice and we collaborated in sharing ideas both in what to ask for and how to fight for it. Um, when the government of Nova Scotia committed uh, a couple of years ago to develop an accessibility law, um, I, uh, I happened to be in Nova Scotia for a while, so uh, for a weekend for, for work, and uh, I had the privilege of taking part, and we've tweeted about this, in a, uh, a founding meeting to get a group uh, started uh, out there uh, to do advocacy in this area. 
and a small group, you'll see chatter on Twitter about this as well, has started uh, uh, work uh, to try to advocate for this kind of legislation at our federal level. But it being a big country spread over five time zones, uh, two official languages, and a very diverse population, um, organizing at the grassroots from one end of the country to the other is not, uh, is not an easy thing to do. No, I, I can I can imagine it's not. Um, so I, I'm somewhat familiar with Ontario. I've got family there, um, I've, and so I've uh, and I've I've visited a few times. It's been my pleasure. But um, I'm I am curious to, as to whether or not social media tools like Twitter and and um, some of the other things like Google Plus have made that kind of grassroots. Um, organizing um, and agitating, if agitating is the right word, advocacy, advocacy easier or um, or whether or not you still think it's a, a significant challenge because obviously you've got the, the large geographical space and, and we certainly have that in, in Europe too. Uh, the answer is uh, absolutely. I mean, I'd like to divide uh, the past 30 years into three eras. Uh, uh, first, back in, in, in the late 70s and the early 80s when we were fighting against into the, the Charter of Rights and the Human Rights Code. Uh, we didn't have an internet. Um, we had to uh, uh, deliver things by uh, snail mail, uh, use the phone. If you needed the same letter sent to different politicians, you had to retype it each time. I mean, it was very old-fashioned. Uh, the next generation, when you talk to young law students about this, they find it's sort of like talking about the, the horse and buggy era. Uh, the next phase is the uh, movement for the Disabilities Act from 1995 to 2005. We got into using the web and email, and that was a hugely important uh, organizing tool for us to reach a lot of people. And it was very helpful, especially because if I'm blind and I'm communicating with someone who's deaf, I don't know sign language and they don't know Braille, but through email and, and such we could uh, share information very effectively. Um, now, since over the past three years or so, um, our coalition has moved into social media. Uh, I will confess that I principally use Twitter. Uh, I still find Facebook as a blind person just more effort than it's worth. But our tweets go out on Facebook, but our and our uh, and our Twitter following has been growing since we started with a grand total of one follower in uh, September of uh, 2011. To now, we're closing in on 4,000 followers between at David Lepofsky and at AODA Alliance. We have two personas, the same content. Um, and, but it's not just the, um, the number of followers. Uh, we're, we're really proud that we get a lot of those um, uh, in any particular week, uh, uh, um, any number of days where our tweets are declared as a top story by one or other provider. Uh, we use Twitter um, to reach politicians and we've had politicians tweet right back to us sometimes even during an election uh, right from the campaign trail. Um, and it's become an important way that we've gotten word out beyond. If people uh, watching this podcast want to get our email updates, we have people following us around the world. You can send a request to us at aodafeedback at gmail.com. That's aodafeedback at gmail.com. Just say, sign me up. That's all you got to say. And we'll put you on our list. You get more detailed updates from us on what we're doing and we get ideas from people around the world and we we share our, our ideas with people around the world but Twitter is uh, is um, really helping uh, get news out more quickly uh, we've live tweeted events and I've seen it I've actually one event I was at where uh, the Toronto Transit Commission was was uh, required to hold a public forum on accessibility we announced that we were going to live tweet it, so the Toronto Transit Commission announced they were going to live tweet it too, I guess because we were doing it, they probably figured they wanted to get in on the action. Yeah. Um, and it generated a lot more traffic, and it was a, a fabulous way for people, both those present, um, several hundred people with disabilities to ride paratransit or our conventional transit system, as well as people who were not present to know what was going on and to, to get involved in the discussion. So it's been a, it's been a huge uh, uh, boon for us. I'll give you one other example. One of our news stories last spring, one of our agenda items is ensuring that elections and voting are acce is accessible for voters with disabilities. Last spring, we had an election in Toronto. We tweeted every single candidate uh, in Ontario, excuse me, we tweeted every single candidate saying, will you commit uh, that you will only go to an all-candidates debate if it's in an accessible venue? 
And through that, we found out that in one particular electoral district in Toronto, there was a plan to hold an all-candidate debate in an inaccessible schoolhouse. Now, the concept of a school building being inaccessible is itself absurd, but we have, unfortunately, too many of them here. Uh, but we learned about this on Twitter. We then tweeted each candidate running in that riding, would they commit not to go to the event? One candidate uh, from one party said, no, I won't go to it. Another one said, yes, I will, and the third didn't answer. We took the issue to the media. We used Twitter to ramp up the pressure, and eventually they decided to move that all-candidate debate from the inside of an inaccessible schoolhouse to the public outdoor parking lot. We forced it outdoors. That's great. <laughs> to, make it, to make it, and uh, this all started on Twitter. Yeah, it all started on Twitter. I, I think it's an amazingly powerful tool. Uh, Deborah's had to wave goodbye, um, but I'm, I'm still here. I'm one of one of the other questions that I, I I'm fascinated. Uh, to ask is is around the whole human rights um, linkage um, and and, and the, the the push between your human rights um, as Canadians and the, the the requirement of the government to proactively uh, make that kind of legislation and set out that roadmap because that's something that that's not really happening in the UK. In the UK, we have the Equality Act, which mm -hmm. is quite a wide-reaching piece of legislation. But it's also in in its wideness. It, it's quite fuzzy. It says you yep. must proactively, you know, take, you know, not discriminate, um, rather than actually laying out any kind of concrete actions that must be taken. It talks about the different types of discrimination, but doesn't actually describe what it is that people need to do. It talks about reasonableness and reasonable adjustments and all of these kind of things. Right. Whereas uh, um, I'm I'm really fascinated that. That you, you you had the the foresight to actually understand that people, suppliers, government organisations need to actually have some kind of description of what that actually means. Because until you you were involved in this, why would you know? Well, what you've just done is summarise the case we made to the public for why we needed this legislation. We said, look, we've got the rights in law that we need. But on the one hand, we don't want to have to sue one barrier at a time. And on the other hand, obligated organizations, they don't want to have to be sued one barrier at a time yeah. to find out what the heck they've got to do. Um, and so rather than having to go to a, uh, now we didn't want the Disabilities Act to take away any of our existing rights. An important protection we won is that in any case where if there's a law that provides more accessibility than the Disabilities Act, that more... Uh, excuse me, powerful law wins. And that's important because we didn't want the government setting accessibility standards under the regula under the Disabilities Act that turned out to be weaker than our human rights and that through the back door they, they took rights away. So what uh, the case that we made for accessibility standards was appealing both to us and to obligated organizations because a responsible obligated organization wants to know what the heck they got to do and when they got to get it done by. It also reduces the cost of compliance uh, when you set these requirements out in detailed regulations. Because uh, if, if you, uh, for example, we, we have accessibility standards enacted that require organizations to meet um, uh, almost all of the requirements of WCAG uh, 2.0 level AA uh, by certain timelines. Now we say the timelines are too long and the exceptions shouldn't be there. Uh, and so on. But in any event, uh, the fact is, uh, before that regulation was passed, um, obligated organizations had a duty under the Human Rights Code, in the case of government, the Charter of Rights, to provide for accessible websites, but they wouldn't know what standard to meet. They probably never heard of WCAG 2.0 or single A, double A, or any of this stuff. So for them to have somewhere to go to that says, this is the standard you got to meet, um, saves them time and money. Uh, and gives provi provides better clarity across the board. The, the problem that we're facing in Ontario, I've, I've painted a rosy picture of where we got 10 years ago. The problem is that the government is doing an inadequate job of implementing this legislation. That's a recurring theme you'll hear in lots of different countries that have disability rights laws. Um, and in fact, if you go to our website, which is www.aodaalliance.org, at www.aodaalliance.org, and you can go to our What's New page, um, you'll see that uh, just uh, a month ago, 
the government made, of Ontario made public an indep- the report of an independent review of the Disabilities Act that they were required to conduct. And it concluded that after 10 years, and despite the government making a sincere effort, this legislation has not made a significant impact on the lives of people with disabilities. And if you boil it all down, the report in effect points us to the conclusion that Ontario is now not on schedule for full accessibility by 2025. The report also maps out a number of important recommendations on how to get us there. We've got a government that's been passing accessibility standards that are too weak, that is not developing the new ones that we need, a number of the new ones that we need, and that is not effectively enforcing the ones that are pa- that have been passed. And, and my, my coalition is in the watchdog role on top of all this. Now, that's not to say we haven't made any progress. That's not to say there haven't been gains. There certainly have. And I certainly believe we're further ahead in Ontario than we would have been had we um, had we not uh, had this legislation. But it is to say that the government's got a lot of work ahead of itself. And we as community advocates have a lot of work ahead of ourselves and, uh, to make the kind of progress we deserve. Okay. So I, I absolutely echo your, your thoughts that often the, the, the legislation is, is great on paper. Um, and the, in the reality of the implementation leaves a lot to be desired. Um, certainly the case in the UK, um, certainly what I see, you know, I work for a, a multinational company, I see it in, in other parts of the world too. One question that, that, that keeps springing into mind is whether or not punitive action is 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 going to resolve everything. I, I think that there's a place for it and, and, I, I, and I do wonder whether or not the, there's enough enforcement going on. But the other thing that, that I've been considering a lot recently is whether or not whilst we apply the, the stick of, um, of legal action, whether or not we should also be actually applying a, a big carrot and that is actually to start giving tax breaks and, and, and tax incentives to businesses and organizations that are accessible? Well, I'll tell you the way it's approached in Ontario. Um, uh, For one thing, uh, uh, we believe that you've got to do a combination of effective uh, outreach to obligated organizations to let them know their obligations. The government's had 10 years to do this, uh, which we say is more than enough time. Uh, The government has got to provide tools to try to make it easier uh, and more cost-effective for organizations to do it so they don't each have to hire the same consultant to tell them the same thing over and over and over. Um, The government has to enact standards that provide the kind of clarity that are needed. And and this independent review report I told you about shows that both we and business told the government that their standards don't provide enough detail, that their accessibility standards... And this is important because the old mythology was that we folks with disabilities, we want to regulate everybody to death and business doesn't want any regulation at all. And what we found out is no, we actually agree. We all want the same thing. We want the kind of detailed regulation that gets us the access we need and lets businesses know what they got to do. But you got to have enforcement. You got to have effective enforcement. You got to have a visible enforcement. So because organizations... Uh, obligated organizations are going to be looking at the government and saying, well, if I don't comply, you know, um, what are the consequences? If we didn't enforce our speeding laws on the highways, you can imagine what speed people would drive at. If we didn't enforce our theft laws, you can imagine exactly how safe your private property would be. Um, Accessibility is no different. Let me turn to the issue of of incentives. For one thing, at least under our system, any money uh, a for-profit organization spends uh, on accessibility is a cost of doing business, so it's already uh, tax deductible. Uh, the question is, should there be more incentives? So what our legislation provides, uh, which is actually really clever by the government, is that the government can provide further incentives if an obligated organization will proceed on accessibility faster than the legislation requires. Um, and, um, and in that regard, uh, sadly, to my knowledge, the government has not actually used that power to offer those incentives. The risk when you do an incentive system is that people will come up with, uh, uh, will either, uh, obligated organizations may try to get the money uh, for whatever reason, but not necessarily to do things on the accessibility that we really need. Um, you know, uh, our, our, the, the view that I think makes the most sense is that um, 
it's it's wrong for obligated organizations some of our municipalities have done this have said well hey government of ontario you're requiring us to do all this accessibility stuff but you're not paying for it and our answer is wait a minute the government of ontario doesn't have to pay to fix everybody's barriers any more than it's got to pay for polluting companies to stop polluting it's a cost of doing business to provide accessibility and therefore it should be borne by the organization whose business it is and if any in any event they get the benefits of the expenditure because they get access to more employees and more customers yeah I, I just to, to, to a large extent I, I, I do agree that you know we, we there are good sound business cases for um, doing accessibility regardless of, of incentivization however um, if we take the Example of sustainability and and some of the, the sort of the carbon agenda. Certainly mm -hmm. in the EU, uh, one of the things that kick started the process was incentives around uh, carbon right. credits and carbon trading. So right, uh, I, and that's I, why I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I'm no, 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 fact, well, that, that's half the fun. Is we can we yes. can we can uh, discuss these ideas. I think it's absolutely. absolutely. I, I think it's it's. Something needs to really get the momentum going because uh, there, there needs to be certainly there's never been any test cases in really decent test cases in in the UK. So the constant thing, as you as you alluded to, is companies will say, "Well, where's the risk? You know, the risk is low of this, so that they'll take a risk-based view. You know, getting sued is a risk of doing business, but maybe they consider that one worth taking because the law has no teeth." Um, let, let, me offer, let me just offer you a couple of ideas. Let me offer you a resource and an, an idea. Uh, okay. A resource, a resource that I think uh, those watching this podcast might find interesting. If you want to learn more about what we're up to in Ontario, how we're doing, and what progress we've made, or what about some of our strategies. Um, uh, we're recording this in March of 2015. In January of 2014, um, I delivered a series of lectures at my old law school on our whole campaign. It's not you don't have to be a lawyer to watch it, you don't have to be a Canadian lawyer, you don't have to know anything about Canada um, or about the law. It's all up on YouTube and it's captioned. If you go to the homepage of aodaalliance.org, you'll see, um, uh, I believe we've got a link on the homepage and certainly on the What's New page to our video lecture series. I also tweet about it from time to time and okay. folks around the world are giving us feedback on it. But let me tell you what I think one of the newest tools is going to be. I'm going to hold it up right in front of our uh, my camera here. You make sure it's on. It, that's my iPhone. And why do I say that? I think the smartphone is going to be used together with social media. could be a major tool beyond legislation, beyond enforcement. Let me tell you why. We can crowdsource this. You see a barrier. We say photograph or video that barrier. If you're blind and you walk into a restaurant and they won't let you in with your guide dog, take out your iPhone, double tap, Turn on voiceover, double tap the camera, double tap video, hold it up. And what I would do is hold it up like this. I don't use a guide dog, but I'd aim it right at the guy who's telling you you can't bring your dog in and announce what date and time it is and say, Sir, I'm, I'm holding our ma'am, I'm holding up my iPhone. I'm blind and I'm videoing you right now. Can you make sure you're in the picture? Because I'd like you to say for the video that you won't let me and my guide dog in. And I'd just repeat the name of your restaurant and your name, sir, please. Because I'd like to post this on YouTube so people can know about this right you hold that up you record it you post it on YouTube uh, you tweet it out there uh, my guess is it could well go viral send a cop a link to it to your local media and that could have a huge impact there's a colleague in our movement um, who is a little person who also uses uh, a wheelchair who went out in Toronto a few months ago and had a friend uh, video him for about three hours to capture on video some of the deeply troubling things that people say to him on the streets. Um, isn't that a cute little leprechaun and that sort of thing. He edited it down to about five minutes and put it up on social media. It went viral. It got picked up by the Huffington Post. It got picked up by a number of media here in Toronto. And that one video by this individual that most people didn't know before that um, really had an impact. In fact, that's how I met the fellow. Okay. Uh, he's okay. also... So the, I, I'm, I'm saying that we, there are ways that an individual who may otherwise feel like they don't have a lot of power can, with with a smartphone um, and the free access to things like Twitter and YouTube, 
um, uh, can make a huge difference. Oh, I think citizen journalism um, uh, uh, combined advocacy um, has a has a huge role to play, and, and it it can be you know, incredibly powerful in in terms of getting a message out there and. and um, influencing companies' decisions because they're aware that their reputation is on the line, etc., in a way that you, you didn't have that power and leverage before. Um, and, and so that, that definitely I agree with you about. Um, I have been following a lot of your tweets. Um, I'm, I'm aware of some of the issues that you've been raising around transportation. Um, I'm surprised at the, at the complete sort of resistance that you had around the sort of the announcements for buses and stuff like that because as, as someone that, that lives in a, a, and works in a, a multicultural city like London that 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 kind of stuff is the lifeblood for tourists now we, we make I'm, billions I'm with of tourism every year and, and guess what they get lost they need those announcements too so it's not only supporting people with disabilities, but it's supporting the tourist industry, which is a massive industry in its own right. So, so I, 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 I'm with you completely. Yeah. And if folks who follow us on Twitter are going to see chatter that we've had out recently, and it's just going to be there's going to be more and more of it. And I'm going to I'll give you a, a, a reason why. This summer, Toronto is proudly going to host the 2015 Pan American and Para Pan American Games, which is like a regional Olympics. Um, and the government's spending a huge pot of money uh, to finance this, hoping it's going to help, uh, you know, boost our tourism and, and, and sport and all that sort of stuff, uh, which is great. So we've been pressuring the government for a year and a half without uh, the kind of success that we deserve to ensure that, like uh, London and uh, like Vancouver when they had the Olympics, there's a significant uh, legacy after the Games of improved accessibility. And we're not just talking about the accessibility of the stadiums where they compete or the village where the athletes live, but we mean tourism and hospitality services, public transit, uh, restaurants, hotels, and so on. So you'll see that we started tweeting this weekend, and we're going to keep tweeting about this, and we're tweeting every member of the Ontario legislature about this, that you know we're expecting 1,600 para-athletes to come to Toronto this summer, if they venture out of the bubble of the stadium and the athletes' village, where are they going to eat? We don't have the kind of number of accessible restaurants in the greater Toronto area that we should have. And you'll also see in our Twitter feed that's gotten a lot of attention, and Twitter's helped us raise this. There's a restaurant in Toronto called Signs Restaurant, S-I-G-N-S, -S, like a sign, like sign language. It's a really cool restaurant because all the waiters are deaf. Now, I happen to be blind, which makes this even more interesting as a challenge. But when you go to the restaurant, the menu teaches you how to sign, use sign language to order your food. It's a great restaurant, right in the middle of downtown Toronto. It's a new restaurant. Um, and the thing is, they decided to put a ramp in in the front of their building, uh, only to have the city of Toronto enforcement guys come along and say, you got to tear that ramp out because it encroaches on the right of way and there are problems with it and so on. Now, so one of the few restaurants that's trying to become accessible, and we got the city of government trying to enforce inaccessibility, while the province of Ontario is doing a poor job of enforcing more accessibility. And we're, we're focusing on the fact that if tourism, if there's a billion people with disabilities around the world, we'd love them to want to come to Toronto uh, to, as a tourist destination and spend their money here. But until we provide appropriate accessible tourism services and hospitality services, um, we're not going to be much of the kind of destination we'd, we'd like to be. And if we're in the process of having our city government try to force a ramp to be torn out in front of one of the few restaurants that was wise enough uh, to try to install one, we got a problem. So, so dude, follow us on Twitter, you'll see more about it. So, uh, what what type of message do you think that can pass to to business who are not compliant? So, if the government behaves like that, no. Well, exactly the wrong message. What you end yeah. up with is getting other businesses potentially worried that maybe they shouldn't bother trying to put in a ramp because if they don't put in a ramp, they don't have to worry about the provincial government using its enforcement powers to insist on accessibility. But if you do put in a ramp, you're gonna have the city government potentially 
getting, you know, threatening to require you to remove it. So that creates all the wrong incentives. It's really uh, uh, counterproductive. And and what and what type of work are you guys doing in order to break into this? Well, one of the things that we, we're doing several things for the Pan and Para Pan American Games, we have been um, leading in trying to press the government to develop an accessibility legacy strategy for tourism and hospitality services. We've taken that message to the government, we've taken it to the media, and we're going to keep doing it. And as the games approach, we've told the government they're going to have either a good news story or a bad news story. The good news story will be the world coming and seeing we've ramped up our accessibility here. And again, not just in the athletes village and in the stadiums, but on the streets, on the public transit and restaurants and hotels and other tourism services. That would be a great news story. Or we're going to have a bad news story where you, people are going to find uh, we're, we're taking to the public a message that we've invited all these people here, but uh, they better not have to eat or go to the bathroom when they're outside the bubble of the of the games themselves. So that's one thing we're doing. And, and similarly with the Science Restaurant, when an issue like this comes up, uh, we don't advocate for a particular organization, but we use it to illustrate the, the enormity of the problem. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what we're doing. And you'll, you'll see more action um, through our email updates uh, and on Twitter. Neil, we don't have sound from your side. Ah, so that's it's been fascinating. We've we've reached the end of our half hour already. So thank you, David. Uh, it's it's been great. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear how things are different um, and, and and the good, the bad, and the quite unpleasantly ugly. Um, so. I'm really pleased that you'll be joining us again tomorrow night on Twitter, or although tomorrow afternoon for you. Um, we're signing off for now. Um, well, thank you so much for including me, and we are eager for people to let us know about their successes around the world or their failures. We want to learn from other people, uh, and we want to share our experiences with other people. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. This is a fabulous podcast, and, and the Access Chat's a great idea, and I'm, I'm really honored to be included. Glad you like it. Thank, Thank you so much, David.